Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm coming to you with another book review, and we are looking at the first book, chronologically, in the Witcher series. Now, I began reading The Witcher last year, that's when I read The Last Wish, and I'm going to be honest with you right from the jump, The Last Wish put me off so much that I didn't read the next book until this year. Matter of fact, I just finished the second book a couple of days ago. And that's because there are issues, in my opinion, with The Last Wish. So, let's go ahead and jump into it. So, first things first, this is not really a novel. It's more a compendium of novellas. Okay, it's a, it's a collection of short stories, uh, all of which take place before the events of the first true novel in the series, which is Blood of Elves. Now, it is extremely important to read The Last Wish and Sword of Destiny. First, those are the two books that really need to be read for Blood of Elves to have the context it needs, and they were both written before Blood of Elves for that reason. Yes, they're collections of short stories, but they are extremely important. However, uh, between the two books, The Last Wish is, in my opinion, by far the worst of the two. And that has to do with the writing. Now, these are Polish books. They were Polish translated to English. Last Wish was translated by one person, and then every other book since then for The Witcher was translated by a man named David French. David French did a wonderful job, from what I can tell with Sword of Destiny. The translator for this book, and admittedly, I can't remember their name. Maybe it's written somewhere on the inside, and I can give it to you. Uh, here we go. Denusia Stock. Sad to say that she, I believe that would be a she, didn't do nearly as good of a job based on the weird writing. Like, reading this book and then reading Sword of Destiny... They felt like they were written by two different people, and I have to assume that's based on the translation work. And I know Witcher fans oftentimes would you know, tell me, hey, we're sorry, it's a bad translation, don't hold it against the book. I have to hold it against the book, because it's the only English version available. You know, I don't, re I, I don't speak Polish, so I can't read that. I don't speak any other languages fluently enough to read a book in another language. And so the only one I have to go off of is the English book. So as an English speaker, I have to judge the English book. It's my only choice. And unfortunately, it's it's not bad, but it's certainly not good. Um, it's really difficult to explain. The writing of the book oftentimes lost me. I felt like I was missing context between conversations, between sections within a story, and some of the word choices didn't necessarily make sense or fit, in my opinion. And then having read Sword of Destiny, certain characters don't even seem to talk the same way between the two books. Characters like Yennefer of Angerberg and Geralt of Rivia, while still feeling the same, also notably felt different, if that makes any sense. Now, the stories contained in the book were fine for the most part. But that's my other issue with The Last Wish, is only one of them, <clears throat> the story with Nibelin, really stuck out at me and made me go, yeah, this is great, and we're really memorable. I vaguely remember the other things that happened. <coughs> you know, um, the things with Dooney and Queen Calanthe and all of that, I remember that. You know, the incident with Geralt and Yennefer and the Jinn, I remember that. But I only remember that they happened. I don't really remember the details of what happened. The Nibelin story, I, I remember front to back. It really had me. The rest of the stories didn't really hold me. They weren't bad, but they weren't memorable for me. And so that's the kind of the other side of this, is the translation is apparently not very good because if it's not the, transla if it's not the translation's fault, then it just means the book was poorly written, or I shouldn't say poorly, the book wasn't written as well as it could have been if it wasn't the translation, and I think most fans would agree that isn't the case, that it's the translation. And it makes me wonder why David French didn't go back and also translate this book so we could have a better edition of it. I don't mean any disrespect to Mrs. Stock, who did the translation for the book, but... Man. I'm sorry, I already said I don't think she did a good job. But then when you also add on that the stories themselves weren't very engaging, and they're not meant to be, to be fair. They were introductory. 
The Last Wish was written, if I remember correctly, after The Sword of Destiny was written, and it was kind of written to give backstory to certain events that take place in Sword of Destiny, such as, you know, Geralt's destined bond to Princess Cirilla, things like that. This book helps to, you know, set all of that up. And so it really is necessary and important reading for that. But because of that also, the entire book largely feels like setup. And I'm not saying that because I need crazy action sequences. I don't personally care all too much if the if there's tons and tons of action. I've got other fantasy series I can read for that. Uh, in my opinion, Andrea Sapkowski's uh, best work are his his relationships and his character work. So I don't mind not having breakneck action in the book. That's not what these are for. This is literary fiction. It's not you know, commercial fiction. What I take exception to is the fact that the stories are kind of boring. In my opinion. Again, I remember Nivellen, and the one I remember, the, I, I think I liked this, the second story I liked uh, most would be with the Striga. And that one I remember, you know, most of it, not all the details, but most of it. Those are easily the two best, and the rest of them, they were setups, they were introductions, and they read like setups and introductions. They didn't re read like, hey, this is a natural chain of events that will then lead into something else. They felt like I was reading something that was meant to be an explained backstory, which, in my opinion, isn't really the way to do a prequel story. A prequel should re read like it's naturally leading up to the next book, not like it was purposely written to explain that book. Just a personal feeling, just a personal belief. Not everything was bad, not by a long shot. I love Geralt's character, I love Yennefer, I love uh, Nivellen. I thought Nivellen's story was tragic, but also fitting for the crime he had committed. Uh, I did enjoy all the unique monsters, things like the Striga, that we don't really see in typical Western fiction. You know, I'm so used to vampires and werewolves and ghosts and orcs and goblins and trolls, and we still have all of that stuff in The Witcher. Well, we don't have orcs and goblins. They're mentioned a few times in some of the books, but we never see them. Um, which is weird. But we don't have them, admittedly. But we do have werewolves and vampires and whatnot, but they're different. They're unique. The vampires are, they come in a range of types. You know, you have Bruxa and Alps and Catacans, and then you have the higher vampires, which are an entirely separate and far more powerful being. I love that. Um, but then we also have things like Kikimoras and you know Strigans, uh, sorry Strigas and Sylvans and oh god, there's just a host of very unique monsters in the Witcher universe, and we meet a few of them in this book, and I love that. I love seeing something different. And the fact that this is pulling largely from Slavic and Polish folklore, I think, did a lot to help the book stand out. It's a, it's a great positive of the book. I just couldn't really get past the fact that I could tell I was reading Setup, which is one of the reasons I haven't read The Silmarillion yet. I'm sure I'm going to love it, but I know it's going to feel like a slog, because reading Setup stories isn't my favorite thing in the world when they feel like a setup story. Uh, the other thing about this is being, by nature of it being a compilation of short stories, I found it a little harder to read because generally speaking, whenever I read a, a short story and I finish it, that itch has been scratched. Yeah, I'm usually like, okay, I've read a story. I don't feel the need to jump into another one. And so it's kind of strange because I can read one 60 page short story and be like, that's enough. But I could read 200 pages of a, of a novel and then, you know, want to keep going. So, short story collections aren't my favorite thing anyhow, but I also didn't feel like the short stories here were very interesting. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't, I don't love this, uh, a lot of what was done here. The concept of witchers, I think, is really, really cool. 
you know, having these boys taken from a young age, and that's not really explained in this book, admittedly, but it is explained uh, in the next book a little bit. Uh, having boys taken at a young age, sometimes by the law of surprise, and sometimes just because, hey, you know, there's a, there's a boy, there's a kid, we need more witchers, we'll take him. But taken at a young age to a witcher uh, stronghold like Cairn Morin, and subjected to the trial of grasses, and mutations, and trials of combat, to where only like four out of ten boys survive from each batch, and it's brutal. But the end result is you get a, an individual with eyes like a cat that can that are better suited to see in the dark. Uh, they have constitutions they can take they can handle t drinking potions that would kill an average human. They have faster reflexes. They're stronger. Um, they're they have way more stamina. I mean, they're effectively superhuman. Now, not to the extent that the games make witchers out to be. The witchers in the books are not nearly as crazy as a depiction in the games or the Netflix TV show even, but they are above the likes of an average human. So somewhere between peak human and superhuman. And then the magic users, like, oh, I forgot to mention, witchers can use certain limited magic called signs. For D&D players, think of them like cantrips. You know, a little blast of fire here, a little defensive spe uh, spell here, a little burst of air there, that kind of thing doesn't begin to compare to what sorcerers and sorceresses can do. And that's the next part, is Yennefer is such a breath of fresh air for a female character in a fantasy story. I've heard people call the Witcher sexist, and I'm two books in, and I very much don't feel that way. Yes, there are some women who are throwing themselves at Geralt. It happens. I mean, there it happens with soldiers and all sorts of stories. And Geralt is, at the end of the day, not a soldier in the military, but he's a soldier fighting a war against monsters. And so, if women are likely to throw themselves at men in the military, men who are guards, why wouldn't they be likely to throw themselves at someone like Geralt? I mean, he's, he's strong, he's fit, he's saving people. It happens. So, I don't consider that sexist. And when we get into the named female characters, like Yennefer, oh my god, they are independent and they are incredibly written. Yennefer does not read like any female character in a fantasy story that I have read to date. I don't know if I'd say she's the best written or my favorite character, because she is kind of a manipulative, selfish bitch. But I love that about her. I love that about her. Because it makes her stand out, and it's realistic. You know, her she doesn't define her value by a, her connection to Geralt or to any man in the series. And you know, she if she sees something she wants, she goes for it. If she wants that man in that moment, she'll have him. If she doesn't, and he doesn't take no for an answer, she's not afraid to burn that man to a crisp or transform him into a toad. So I, I love that about Yen, and she's very much not above manipulating people to get her way. And so when I'm used to reading these Mary Sue type characters in fantasy stories who base their entire worth around a man, or who were only badass at certain points when the story calls for it and otherwise turn back into the submissive housewife, I, I don't I don't jive with that all too well. So Jennifer was by far a breath of fresh air and I really enjoyed her sections of the book. I enjoy the toxic relationship between her and Geralt, and yeah, it's toxic, guys. It's If you knew a couple like them in real life, um, you would be advising whichever one was your friend to get out of that relationship. But that's also real. I mean, we all know people in those toxic relationships, and we know people who love those kind of people. I've certainly met my fair share of men and women who are openly attracted to certain kinds of toxicity. Geralt was just attracted to that kind of toxicity. He's got a thing. That's his kink. You know, let him have it. So, I don't know. I, I enjoyed the world and the characters and everything about the book except for the writing of the stories. Which is why this book only gets 3 out of 5 stars. And that's my rating for the book, is 3 out of 5. The next book is, in my opinion, so much better, and I'm excited to start reading Blood of Elves. I've actually got all the, the hardcovers now. 
and I plan on reading all of them to see which is my favorite, but uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, setting. It's very unique. This just isn't the best start. And again, it put me off for an entire year because I was so disappointed by it. I went into it wanting to love it because I loved the games and, you know, like the Nightmare of the Wolf movie and the first season of the show, not the second and certainly not the third. And I had watched the old Polish Witcher TV show and movie and thought they weren't good, but they were fun. And I played the Witcher tabletop RPG with my friends and I really enjoyed it. And I read a bunch of the Witcher comics and I really loved those and I was just ready for more and... I don't know, this one didn't hold up for me. But it's a setup book. So if you're like me and you're disappointed with it, keep pushing forward. I promise you the next book is better and will have you just anxious to read the rest of the series. So that has been my review of The Witcher, The Last Wish. Uh, I didn't mention Dandelion because he's, in my opinion, a little bit more prevalent in the second book. So you'll hear more about, you'll hear about him then. But I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And until next time, I'm, I will see you later.